Thank you so much, Stephanie and Stephanie, and um, everybody here for coming out tonight. I'm so thrilled, first of all, to be back in Ohio, where so much of my career began um, in Columbus, and we'll be talking about that. But this is an amazing um, moment to, you know, to, be, to get this kind of um, recognition. It's just an honor to reflect on my professional journey in art education. And I, do, I didn't know John Michaels very well, but I remembered his amazing energy and enthusiasm. And so um, to be connected with him through uh, this legacy that he left is really impressive. So thank you. So I'm going to talk about my art education journey. And um, I'm, my, sub, my little subtitle here is, if you don't get lost, there's a chance you'll never be found. And it comes from a, an art ed textbook from the 1970s, um, which I'll show you a little bit later. Um, but it seemed to be very appropriate um, to have something, a quote like that, um, guide one in a world where usually things go one after the other. So I very often will share this quote with students and as they um, begin doing research and remind them that um, it's very important to allow yourself to get lost. But thank you for being lost for a while, or you may never find what you're looking for. So um, my journey theme is really kind of focused on visual literacy and equity or access to that visual literacy. It is being visually literate is our birthright. Um, Probably everybody in here has no problem, but the people outside um, are not necessarily connected. And so um, that is why so many of us and so many of the students who are here are uh, concerned, um, and, and rightly so, with educating all people. So I'm very concerned with the criticality of deep engagement in exploration and discovery for creativity and insight. And there'll be three areas that I'm going to be talking about. Um, one is being able to focus. And I really think that more and more in our world, we are so um, distracted. <laughs> um, uh, this kind of focus and balancing is even more critical than ever. Um, sometimes in a place like Washington, D.C., it's even just true for driving. <laughs> just being focused on the task at hand. Um, and um, Another area that I'm very concerned about is access. That everybody, as I said before about a birthright, everyone you know, um, is entitled to be able to visually express whether they believe it or not, you know, whether they realize it or not. Because we're living in an extremely visual world. And finally, I'm very concerned with community, where we share vision. And um, so I'll be talking about these things. Um, and I'm going to start with a little bit with my background and experience that kind of has led me to the work that I have done. So, can anyone relate to the, my early influence, Crayola crayons? Anybody? Oh, please, yes. Remember how they smelled? Remember how they looked? Remember when you were sorry when you broke one? Okay, well, this was the you know, beginning, and I think I. I have a sense that um, probably every time I got sick, my mother got me a new box of crayons um, and, uh, <laughs> and coloring books. So, you know, uh, good thing I'm not a hypochondriac, but you can see, <laughs> see the connection. But I had some other influences. Um, I lived, um, I grew up in a relatively small, small apartment in Queens, New York. And um, so um, crayons were, you know, they were doable in terms of messes that could be made. but. One influence I had, and maybe some people may recognize this, was a, a program called Winky Dink. And Winky Dink was, as you can see, and I like to say this is the early work, artwork on the monitor, um, it actually was a piece of plastic or vinyl that went on the TV and you could draw on the TV. Remember, TVs were pretty new then too. So, um, so that was one kind of fascination for me. Um, that really came right into my home. Um, another was, this is my first art teacher. His name is John Nagy. There's actually an interesting website now with more information. 
um, about him and his legacy. But he taught me, um, took me away from the coloring books and taught me about variations of shapes and forms. And I just loved the, the learn to draw sets and the learn to draw um, book. And I recently got, you know, I recently found one. And I can remember the, act, the you know, the steps, step by step, and how I, does anybody relate to this? Just please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so um, anyway, this was really, you know, really something. Um, I also used to love um, this Venus Paradise coloring sets with these colored pencils. And this was color by number. And that kind of allowed me to do whole compositions. <laughs> So um, those are some of my beginnings. And, um, and also, I think, a real fascination or interest in materials. So and you'll see that now I, I bundle materials myself for, for students um, because those materials are really important as tools. So those are some, some uh, of the earliest uh, studio memories. But my main uh, memory of talking about art comes from this work, and I have it in my family room, and I really hadn't thought about it until I got this award and was preparing this speech. But um, my, I didn't go to museums, there weren't many in Queens, um, but I would go to my grandparents' house, and my grand, they had this painting, and it's about, um, oh, it's about 20 by 16, it's not this big. Um, but uh, this painting was on the wall, and my grandfather would always talk about it with me. And we would talk about, and I, like I, I forgot that, you know? We would talk about these people, what was their story, what was happening with them, um, this man is smoking, look at that staircase, but look, <laughs> look at that ship, you know? And so, and he, we would talk about, but we never came to any closure. And what he really pointed out, you can't tell if this is the mass, or it's part of the stairs, or how is it hanging. And, um, and it would be something that we would, we would talk about. And um, my grandparents came over in um, 1938. They escaped, escaped the, the Holocaust. And I don't even know how they got this painting <laughs> to the United States. But I think what I learned, I mean, First of all, he didn't use the term trompe l'oeil, but certainly, certainly it was there. But I think what I gained from all that was curiosity, un addressing uncertainty or ambiguity, and focus, as well as relationships, you know, among the people, the people and this object. Um, and I really think what I learned to question what I was seeing and to look for evidence. And um, even if I couldn't figure figure out the other, you know, what the what the story was, I could live with that. And I think it's part of my artistic mind. Um, so it turns out now I've done a little bit of research and I know the name of the artist, and I still don't know how they got this work. So, but um, you can just sort of see how it might have been really influential. Um, and um, for a lot of the work that I've done since. So, so actually, we moved from Queens um, when I was 12. My parents actually got divorced and ended up moving to Manhattan. Um, and I went to um, Robert F. Wagner Junior High School on 76th Street, the east side. And it was very different. Um, one of the things that was kind of interesting was that it was very close to Central Park. So sometimes in my lunch hour, I would go and have lunch or sit on the big sculpture of Alice in Wonderland. And sometimes I'd even go to the Met. Just little short visits, but I would do that because it was close by. Um, at this time, um, it was kind of clear that, it was, that there were problems in get, you know, the high schools were not all equal. And so it was proposed to my parents that I should go to, consider going to a school like Art and Design, High School of Art and Design, Music and Art, and um, to apply to those schools, those special schools in New York that they had at that time. Other schools that are similar are St. Peter Stuyvesant, Product Science, and so forth. 
So I needed to have some art lessons. I needed some formal instruction uh, that would take me further than the uh, John Nagy and so forth. So I ended up taking private art lessons with Mrs. Schoen. And it was a fascinating time. Um, first of all, she had like a one bedroom apartment. These are pretty tight, really tight in New York, still are. Um, and so, you know, I couldn't believe I'd be sitting in her living room drawing a still life on her ta table. <laughs> and I went out to art supply stores and I learned about color, real, you know, co names of colors and umbers and siennas and, and so forth. Um, and so it was a very exciting time um, to have that kind of uh, nurturing. And it was, um, I was really developing a portfolio so I could apply to the high schools um, in New York. So it was kind of interesting that um, one day, here's a piece I did that um, was a, a ink, uh, purple ink on, uh, on newsprint, and um, it was, um, oops, let me say about that. It was from Observation, and the title was I Wonder, and I brought it to my art teacher, and he liked it, um, but I don't, you know, I didn't think anything of it. Well, one day I'm sitting in assembly, and my name gets called, and I am sent to the stage, and I'm handed a big matted piece of work, and it's this, and I'm supposed to hold it up. And apparently it was entered into a, into a, a contest. And so it was a really early form of recognition that included artists and poets, um, and I was really shocked. Just about as shocked as I am about this. But I was really <laughs> shocked. <laughs> so um, it kind of gave me the insight of how important recognition is when you get it or how you get it. And um, it was kind of interesting that I was on the, they actually brought us to the roof of the building, that's me there, um, and took a picture at Herald Tribune. So that was like really something in New York where you know, things like that could happen. Um, I did get into the high school of music and art. And um, I applied. It was a very rich environment with lots of art learning, very stimulating, and lots of music all the time as well. Um, and it was interesting that in my senior year, you got to pick what you wanted to major in or what you wanted to take in an advanced level. So I took painting. Um, and as it turned out, the teacher I had, who I, I liked a lot, because it was advanced, he really did, he did not, um, it was totally unstructured. So there were like three or four kids in the class who they didn't do what they wanted to paint, and they just painted, and the rest of us kind of didn't really know. Um, and kind of, you know, hung out, but it wasn't really a great way to feel, you know, when you were in that senior, you know, senior time and you wanted to accomplish anything. So, or something, anyway. So. You know, I think it was a little bit of a, 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 a loss of growth and confidence and so forth. Um, it's kind of interesting because then when I went to City College, which was right next door, uh, City College of New York, and, and these schools were both in Harlem, um, I realized, um, that, you know, I, I actually started as a math major. <laughs> and I wonder whether I started as a math major because um, I didn't see the primacy of art as a high-value subject, you know, so I, that's where I started as a freshman. And, but math was taught as, you know, operational. It wasn't, it wasn't a creative capacity the way they taught it. I, I liked the capitalist, but I kind of didn't get it, know why. So um, I switched back to art education. I kind of, but I, I kind of, I craved some creative structure or when I think of the word structure, certainly instruction is part of it. So I went, I was at City College and as a sophomore, um, I switched art education. I worked with some wonderful uh, professors uh, and artists, Sherman Drexler, um, Joan Price, Irving Kaufman, who was very famous. I think he signed my registration a couple times. I didn't really get to work with him. But um, it was a wonderful time and we went to lots of museums um, and galleries on weekends and after school. A whole new world opened up and an expansive universe was suddenly at my feet. 
And of course, it was the 60s. <laughs> so it was a good time. So I learned about, I learned about you know, the history of our field through readings and art education by Eisner and Ecker. Um, the cover I have on mine that I still have is a dark red um, canvas color. So it's you know, the original. Um, but I also got, got excited by a book um, called 100 and 100 Ways to Have Fun with an Alligator. And this is where that quote came from. If you don't get lost, there's a chance you'll never be found. And just something about the book from the back cover. Uh, it says, this book is playful. It is an invitation to a party. Imaginative and beguiling, it is also deceptive. Not one of its pages preaches about art, yet none teaches anything else. So it was really a, a, a very invitational, um, I think you can still find some of these books for very little you know, on the internet, but it was um, lots of possibility. And uh, another book by this uh, publisher, who, and the name, was, the name of the publisher was Art Education Inc., um, was Art of Wonder in the World, and maybe some of you remember this book, An Art Tempo of Today by Jean Mary Mormon. So a lot of these books, have, you know, they really uh, shared a lot of possibility, and it was very, very exciting. So um, I went through the program. Um, it's interesting, when I started in the fall of 1968, school was closed because of um, anti-war demonstrations. But it did, it did open up, and um, uh, at the time, I, at the time um, apparently, um, there were no teaching jobs. <laughs> and I kind of knew that going in. It was going to be very hard to find a job. So, um, and it was, I think it was pre-recession. So I actually um, took, I went on interviews. I took buses and ferries. I carried shopping bags with student projects. Um, I remember one time going to Staten Island, taking the bus to the subway, to the ferry, to the bus. <laughs> and I actually got that job. But um, I got several jobs that turned out. But I ended up going to Seward Park High School um, on the Lower East Side. Um, there, there I am in my Marlo Thomas that girl look. Um, not, hopefully not the way Marlo Thomas looks now. But anyway, um, I was pretty excited. And um, two things were really special there. The school was steeped in diversity. It was near Chinatown and Little Italy, and so that was very exciting. And the other thing um, that was really impressive was the position that I took turned out to be that of my private art teacher, Mrs. Schoen. So I, you know, that was kind of a really interesting cycle for me. Um, so um, shortly after that, I, I got married um, and in New York City. Uh, to my husband, Stephen Sandell. Um, he, uh, I actually did substitute teaching in the Bronx um, for a while, and um, I remember coming home for lunch and not wanting to go back, <laughs> but I did. Um, and then we moved to Dublin, Ireland, where he uh, was studying Irish unemployment, and I was working as an artist and traveling. And during that time, um, my husband got, got a position to be an assistant professor of economics at Ohio State. And I applied to graduate school, and I started corresponding with Kenneth Morantz. And um, he was quite an interesting, wonderful mentor, um, and quite a character. And I remember he, he said he was writing me from the belly button of Ohio. So just to give me some, just to give me some global understanding. <laughs> and um, so we ended up going to Columbus, and um, it was a, a very interesting time uh, with the different people I was working with, uh, from Ken Morantz to Gil Clark to um, Arthur Eflin. Um, and I, I, I hope I can name everybody, but I wanted to just show you a picture of, of Steve and me um, seated by the hearth of our house on East Torrance Road in Columbus. And the thing that was significant about, um, about East Torrance Road was that we were right down the street from where Manuel Barkin had lived. 
So for those of you who know Manage Manual Bart, it, it seemed to kind of come with um, uh, an interesting twist. So my years at Ohio State were, were quite wonderful. In addition to Mar Dr. Morantz, Dr. Eflin, Regina Degg, Terry Barrett. Terry Barrett taught me black and white photography <laughs> at the time. And I made amazing, wonderful friends um, in, in, as my students. So you know, all of you who are here as students, keep in mind that you are, you are set for a lifetime of camaraderie, connection, uh, we still, we still uh, group together at, at national conferences. It's, it's a lifetime of, of wonderful uh, professional support and collegiality. Um, and some of the people that I, this includes Georgia Collins, Marianne Stankovich, Jackie Kibbe, uh, Mary Erickson, um, uh, and um, Egle Gates, who came today, Connie Shalinsky, who came from Columbus. Um, and others. Um, the other thing I discovered that was kind of interesting for me, um, very, very new for New York, it was something called football. <laughs> so that was really something. <laughs> and I went to my first game, and I, I believe I had Dewey's um, artist experience, and I didn't get much reading done. So, <laughs> um, so some of the things that really affected me um, were the hot beat, and this is, this is a scan of my old book, the guidelines for planning art instruction in the elementary schools of Ohio. Um, I was very taken with the structure of creative expression, critical response, and art and society. Somehow, where I was coming from, New York, we were not, you know, we were not really focused on on, on those kinds of concepts that Laura Chapman and others had worked on. So that was, and I think, it affected a lot of my work and emphasis on context. Um, while I was there, I also um, got to do more studio art, and so I did a lot of, you know, I did a lot of painting. Uh, I actually painted in my office. Uh, Jackie Kibbe and I shared an office, and I brought in an easel and, and worked there. Um, and then some other wonderful things were um, I took a summer course where we studied Guernica, just Guernica, and all the all the work and all the things that were happening. Um, and, and, and all of uh, the pre-work of Yannicka, um, and that was a wonderful experience to be able to just, I guess, focus, <laughs> as opposed to memorizing, you know, 100 slides. So um, I uh, was a TA, and I loved it, and uh, I thought teaching teachers was the best, the greatest multiplier, and I really believe that teaching is a performing art, and uh, love, uh, just thought of how important it was to work with pre-service learning and collaboration. Um, and I did, uh, after a couple of years, I did work at the um, newer campus uh, where I was curator of the art gallery and kind of ran the art program. So it was really a wonderful opportunity from TA to, to assistant professor. And I'm just so grateful for it. Um, and let's see. There was a time where we were very focused on, on feminism and uh, Linda Nochlin's essay um, uh, uh, regarding you know, why have there been no great women artists. And during that time, I was painting. My friend at Glay helped me make my own canvases. I stopped buying things from the store. And um, I had a Professor King who told me actually to stop painting stop paint, making these paintings and spend my time mixing colors on palettes. <laughs> and I had to show him the palette, so I spent, he had me mix colors for a month. Well, that was quite a lesson. And it was really quite a nice structure to really learn color. <laughs> so I was very grateful for that. I had, a, my, for my master's uh, show, I had a, um, uh, I actually had four works of art and I had them in a programmed environment um, where, these are the images, but in a, in a 25 by 25 square uh, room, you would see these four works, one on each wall, and next to it, a projector, uh, I see a projector over there, a carousel projector, um, which would kind of show images from the source 
and sequence them in a way that would engage you in, um, in a, I guess, more of a fluid painting than a final product. So very, very interested in process and um, was pretty excited about it. And, uh, had a, and what was interesting, though, is that I, I did a lot of the writing based on uh, cubism and less of the feminist um, ideas that were happening at the time. But that was yet to come because I took a women's studies course uh, in art history. And because I was work, had been working with cubism, I studied Marie Lauren Sand. How many of you are familiar with her work? Okay, all right. Well, she's a French artist. A lot of her work looked a little like this, kind of very feminine, pastoral, you know, sort of pastel -y and like pastoral kinds of romantic scenes. And I was very interested um, in her work because um, the work she did between from 1906 to 1913, like this work, um, was connected to the Cubists. She was known as, I guess, Apollinaire's mistress, and he wrote about her as a Cubist, and Picasso and others didn't like that, and so I kind of really got immersed in that period. Um, in fact, this work, you know, does it remind you of anything Picasso did? Like Lady like Mademoiselle? A little, that was an amazing period. So, um, uh, but I looked at her, and um, mostly looked at these two pieces, um, which one is a Apollinaire, I'm sorry, Apollinaire, um, I'm sorry, group of artists down here, and this one is Reunion in the Country. And what I studied was how was the iconography, where she placed herself, and that she saw herself, you know, seriously, um, and. Um, and, and you know where, how she viewed that period, and so um, it was interesting because this was a this was Picasso's mistress over here, and even some feminist um, art history books misattributed um, Marie Lauren Sand to that figure. So it was very exciting to make these discoveries, to focus, make discoveries in art history, and be invited to um, publish. Uh, in the very first women's art journal in 1980, um, uh, Marie Lawrence Sack, Cubist Muse Amour. And I actually went on to present at CAA. But what was kind of exciting also was not being an art historian, but being able to do art history anyway. <laughs> so these are some of my learnings. And my doctoral work involved looking at the feminist art movement as an educational force, um, or feminist art education, and looking at the women's movement. And I, I'm going to move a little quicker because I'm looking at the time. But um, I looked at how the women's movement personally educated people, how it informally educated people through a visual dialogue and a written dialogue, and how it formally educated women through women's studies and to potential uh, members of the art community. And what I saw, again, looking for something that's missing, or the sins of omission, as Linda Nachman might have put it, I, looked, I didn't see art teachers who are responsible for children. I saw children, school children who are being um, neglected, to say the least. And so I really looked at you know, um, what if we envisioned, um, well, how important it is because um, these children become the members of the art audience um, and so forth. So that's pretty much what I worked on um, and that became part of my dissertation. Um, and I, I think what's kind of also what I want to bring out is that I have to visualize things to really understand them. Um, even as a, in, in an analytical way as well as in, in an artistic way. Not that this is, the, you know, anyway. So, um, and this article actually was um, selected, uh, editor selection by Sandy Packard uh, in the 50 years of studies as a choice from the 70s. 
So one of the most exciting things, most important things, was my collaboration with Georgia Collins. Ken Morantz introduced us. We were both working in the same kind of same issues in different ways, and we we just bonded it, and and we would talk late at night. We'd go to conferences. Um, we wrote articles together. We developed ideas and approaches. We came up with the term hidden stream. Um, to represent art that was anonymous, that dealt with um, processes that very often aren't included in the mainstream. So we really had, so had a lot of fun um, with all that, and we went to a lot of NAEA uh, Women's Caucus events. We really got to know role models like June King McPhee, I can't believe it, uh, Laura Chapman, Mary Lou Kuhn, Meryl DeYoung, Kathy Connors, Julie Lindsay. Um, we did propose um, a book, and we wrote Feminist Art Education in 1984. Um, we also had Enid Zimmerman and Mary Ann Stankowitz who wrote about women in uh, art education. So um, it was a very, very exciting time. And um, we also worked with others. So um, in 1996, we actually put, we edited an anthology together, and um, we were really excited about that work as well. Um, and then we also worked in you know inside the field, outside the field, and inside the field. And finally, um, in uh, 20 years later, after my dissertation, um, Peg Spears. Um, from Pennsylvania, she she did her dissertation on feminist art education 20 years later, and we wrote together um, a translation. It's a little hard to read, but translations was um, a it still it still exists. It was it was created and actually Georgia Collins suggested it when she was editor of studies, and it was a way to translate theory into practice. And so NEA still uses them, but it was very exciting to do it around issues. So I'll talk about a personal and professional transition. So in 1979, we moved from Columbus to Washington, D.C. Uh, in 1980, I had a baby, my first son. Um, I was um, editor of the Women's Caucus, The Report. And I became a fellow at the National Endowment for the Arts as well. So it was a lot going on. Uh, 1981, we moved to Bethesda, Maryland, only about 10 miles out of D.C., and I started teaching as an adjunct professor um, and um, at George, um, George Washington University, University of Maryland, and then in 1982, I had a second son. Um, here's a painting, I saw a portrait I did of uh, Paul New Baby. Um, I started to teach private art lessons at home, while serving as an adjunct professor at George Mason University, I felt like I needed much more practice in working with kids than I had in getting a master's and a doctorate kind of rel relatively early. And it was fascinating because I would work with kids, and I'll show you some of the work, but, um, and, and I would bring it to the university so they could see the work evolving. And I also wrote articles for parents, so, um, you can't see it too well, but there's a, one of my, my son's drawing of, of me and his brother and his dad. Um, in 1984, I was president of the NEA Women's Caucus, and the book Women Art and Education was published. I did work as a consultant and trainer at National Gallery of Art, but what I kind of was really excited about was um, uh, working as a commercial curriculum consultant on artworks and portfolios, um, because what I found was um, that research can really be pragmatic. The value of the research research that we did for you know bringing this work to children and engaging them and thinking visually um, really put an impact on their learning. So that I was very grateful for that to have that that opportunity. So I've always been interested in drawing pedagogy. And um, I love the art history and studio connections. So this book by Brent Wilson and Marjorie Wilson and Al Hurwitz, three people who've already gotten this award. Um, I just absolutely love this book. 
And um, I'm very, in, in particular very interested in the five modes of seeing so that we could even help people work from memory, observation, imagination, past, present, future, uh, narrative, and experimental. And um, I began to draw more interesting studio work from works of art, such as the Bayou Tapestry, um, and try to connect that with narrative art of children. And it kind of led me to the marking and mapping that I do that's informed by art. So um, I, let's see here, here's, here's one example. But I have a little film called Journey of an Artful Problem. It's on YouTube. And it talks about taking a studio problem. For example, um, initially when I had kids marking and mapping their whole lives, as, uh, and also um, kind of editing that on a long sheet of paper, it varied in different ways. It started with markers, but it ended up using different reds, yellows, and blues, kind of working from the color theme from the Bay Tapestry, and how the form, theme, and context could evolve. So, that was um, some of the work that I did and led to some other things. So from 1989 to 2003, I taught at MICA in Baltimore, wonderful school, um, very focused on quality of performance um, and education for, you know, in all departments, of very much you know, on, on effective teaching. And we you know, did um, a lot with student teaching, the student teachers and celebrating their preparation. And I know you do that here too, which is great because this is the foundation. Um, I also got to work with the Baltimore Museum of Art, which um, had a wide range of contents, very exciting, and was able to engage our, engage our students in picking an object and owning it. Not having to have insurance or security, but owning it in their heart, really knowing a work for a whole semester. So they picked a work of art, they, we, they, or, and they had criteria, and they had to be open, but they, when the work was picked, then they, with several students, they did a family tour. So their initial research on that object was to, um, to uh, uh, learn about it for teaching purposes. Then, after the family tour, they worked on making, creating an instructional resource that related this work to other works of its kind and other, other themes and contexts. And finally, they did art about it. And sometimes we had the curator come. We did a lot with visual journaling. Um, we did these artful adventures. During that time, I was the higher ed director at NAEA. I learned a tremendous amount. Worked with CAA as well. We began to make a lot of connections. And um, uh, one thing I did at CAA was write for their education uh, issue. Um, and this was inspiring pedagogy, the art of teaching art. But during this time, which was a wonderful time, I, my husband got sick, and he actually um, uh, passed away in Boston. Um, at the time, I, I got the June King McPhee Award, which was wonderful, and he knew he had done some really important work. He worked for the Social Security Administration. Well, he got an amazing, when he, after he passed away, he got an amazing legacy, and um, the creation of four or five each year, uh, Stephen Sandell Scholars uh, for Research um, at Boston College, and a dissertation award at uh, University of Michigan. So I'm very, very grateful to, you know, his memory, his legacy lives on. Um, but one of the things that happened when I finally went back to work, and I went out to see my student teacher, and we talked, well, what are you working on? She said, well, we're gonna do a puppet unit. Well, I had, I, I had a lot of Steve socks. And they all became puppets. And so, you know, that made me feel so good to be able to transform uh, material into meaning. I was also working on my own art at the time with the thought that a, that a really good museum visit inspires you to want to go to the studio. And so I created an interactive uh, exhibit with my work and left 
uh, materials. And when people went to Saturday school, their kids would work and, and so forth. So that was kind of fun. And uh, I did another online, online painting course that I wanted to share in the gallery. And that was kind of interesting. And then from 2003 to uh, 2014, I, um, I ended up going to George Mason University. George, uh, the DC area really needed an art ed program. They only had programs up in Baltimore and down in Richmond, Virginia. So I uh, was recruited to create an MAT program to ensure that, um, we, that the preparation of highly qualified teaching candidates for needed jobs. And so that was quite wonderful. One of the things I loved about it was the museums. So we did Artful Adventures of the Krieger, the, the Phillips uh, Museum for Women in the Arts, Smithsonian American Art and National Portrait Gallery. And my students came up with object-specific strategies as creative act, you know, and just in studying the work and focusing, they came up. So here's a story about the Buddha with the Buddha behind uh, Jonathan. They also loved working together with the museum educators. Um, they presented at NAEA conferences, and they presented at the student roundtable. Who just presented the student roundtable? You did. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. So that's wonderful. But I realized that um, we are living in such an increasing visual world that, um, and this is a while ago, but even more so, that people, you know, that, that as opposed to the kinds of books we used to, travel books we had, people want to see, you know, they want to see the anatomy of a block in Paris so they can envision where they are. And use visual dictionaries, or use visual dictionaries to, um, uh, to learn languages, or use a visual thesaurus, or even be aware that scientists are looking for ways to display their findings. So artists aren't the only ones who need visual skills and so forth. And it's just been coming. And really, everybody is a curator if you do Pinterest and share <laughs> images and so forth and collect. So um, I've been really concerned about visual literacy, um, that everybody needs it. Um, it's not just for, for a few. And I love a quote by Bill Ivey, if our children don't learn to shape images, images will shape them. And so one of the things I did um, sort of on an advocacy level was I proposed for NAEA, I wrote this um, um, job description, what it means to be an, a visual art educator. And so they, they did the visual design, but um, I felt I needed that because my students you know, needed to know it's not a job, it's a profession. And here's, and here's the description. So that's one bookmark, and I'll be giving some now tomorrow at the workshop. Um, also very interested in, in Daniel Pink's six new senses that everybody needs, a sense of design, story, symphony, empathy, play, and meaning. And so another bookmark for that. And I really challenge my students, in any lesson, you can teach all six of those. You just have to be mindful or intentional about it. It's not hard. So um, just moving towards um, my interest in visualizing for decoding meaning, um, there are three key areas. One is form theme context, looking at how a work is, what the work is about, what's the big idea, and what's the relationships to the big idea, not just you know, because our kids can say, so what? And context, when, where, by whom, for whom, and why the art was created and valued uh, from the art historian's perspective. And that gets into the significance and relevance of what we're looking at, what we're experiencing. So I started by looking at the art lesson as a, as a work of art, um, and really, Artists and teachers intuitively tend to balance form, theme, and context. But I want to make it more accessible, more visual. So I created a palette, um, one of many, which is a visual organizer. And even though it is three separate columns, it's really meant 
could be woven back and forth. So I'm just going to take a minute, really, a really short time to just walk you through just an example. How many people are familiar with this work? Okay, how many people know the name of the artist? How many people know how to pronounce the name of the artist? <laughs> okay, the <laughs> group. How many people know the date? Okay, well, all I needed to know when I was learning about art was this. That's what I needed to know. And I, I suggest we need to know more. So, um, just to take you through, these are the criteria things that one can look at, and I've got some examples here, so you might all of a sudden see overlap, huh? You might notice little tiny people, little tiny people. <laughs> um, or like me, you might have noticed little people that only fairly recently that I realized that they were in pairs, which of course they would be in pairs. Because <laughs> how, how could you man the boat? Um, and even looking at Mount Fuji in the distance. So one can look at the form and take it apart. If we had time, we would do that. One can look at the thematic qualities, the big idea. We can look at the subject matter. We can look at art historical references with water that has overtaken humans from Noah's Ark to um, Watson and the Shark. We can look at, and this is a Jennifer Bartlett that was based on, on um, the Great Wave. Certainly can look at films. Um, how many of you remember Fantasia? It's maybe the first time you ever saw water just overwhelming. Well, I love the way his fingers are doing this. It reminds me of the wave, what I see in that wave. And certainly films. Um, Jaws, Perfect Storm, and certainly Life of Pi. So there's so many references on the theme that might make this even str you know, stronger. Like, why would we look at this? <laughs> And finally, the contextual qualities. When, well, it wasn't one year. It was, this, you know, it took time and it was over a period where Japan is set of islands, by for whom Hokusai, and I don't have time to read it, but if, the, the, if you reread that statement about the old man mad about drawing, he talks about being persistent and taking time and looking at things. Um, and certainly all of the events that we have experienced from tsunamis, inconvenient truth, the Haiti tragedy, the Gulf spill. Um, I particularly love the, the Chilean miners. Remember, they came up in pairs. Remember that? Um, the next tsunami, um, Hurricane Sandy. I usually have to update this all the time. <laughs> and I always like to have an icon in, in visual culture because we are living in a time of that. So, Here's just a couple of um, images from my Great Waves Pinterest page. You can look it up if you want. Some of them are a lot of fun, actually. Um, so um, you can see the variety. But the big question is, how does a balance of formal, thematic, and contextual qualities reveal layers of meaning? And so um, here's a palette that is filled in, but it's not meant to be an answer sheet, but rather something that you would cross out, circle, and so forth, and add to. I'm just going to continue because of the time. Um, so re rebalancing, if you think about form, theme, and context, and you realize that modernism has perhaps overemphasized form, and postmodernism has perhaps overemphasized theme, and visual culture has perhaps overemphasized context. You kind of maybe see a reason why you would like, you know, why it makes sense to go with a balanced approach. Um, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates talk about the three R's in education, teaching from rigor to relationships to relevance. So, and, and, you know, one could do body, mind, spirit, so there are lots of connections to that. Um, at Crystal Bridges, they use FTC, they had to very quickly um, take a collection that they didn't have research for, and they, they identified 200 works of art, and also uh, their outdoor collection. And they created FTC documents. Their FTCs are a little different than mine, they're simpler. And they use it to train for training and for uh, curriculum development and research. And here are a couple of 
of the palettes, one uh, with Rosie the Riveter, and this other one on um, the dogwood. So I've created, I keep creating these palettes that keep evolving, but it's for decoding and encoding meaning and a whole range of, of ways to work. So I want to uh, con just continue because um, I've always been concerned that so many people think they can't draw, and I believe that um, there are ways to, to get everyone to draw, and I call it marking and mapping. Um, uh, this is from a show from 2012. I always have interaction. I actually, in the museum, uh, came every week on Thursday from 3 to 4, set up tables and had people working in the gallery with me and learning and experience, learning um, just having that, that, act, that activity that um, connected them to the process. And um, sort of a contrast, and there's Jason. <laughs> he came to that opening. <laughs> but it was pretty interesting that, you know, I started with marking, and then marking and mapping is the organizing. So the, the process involves um, whatever materials you have, but really two rules. One is to just consider all your space. It doesn't mean fill all your space, whether it's this size or this size, but consider all the space and transform any mistake into a surprise. So I've been amazed at how people have done that. Um, here are some of my students showing their, marking and mapping their pre-service art histories before they came to the program. These are mark, these are, are mark and mappings uh, that took uh, 15 weeks in studying the history of the field of art education, uh, working with Marianne Stankovich, Jackie Kibbe, and Kim Sheridan. They, and we're, we continue to, to do that, giving them time as you read, read and learn to get, a, get the map that you conceptualize so you, when you start teaching, you can go into the field and have a sense of your heritage. Um, artists, um, curators <coughs> in DC, group of people kind of uh, marking and mapping their retirement, <laughs> um, using artist trading cards uh, for marking. These are emerging art uh, professionals in DC. And finally, at World Tai Chi Day in Northern Virginia, um, marking and mapping your gratitude. So there are a lot of possibilities. Um, the key thing I, I want to say, and these are, these are done at Rancho La Puerta, um, is you can see the smiles in these in the faces with the work and the pride and the connection. So um, it, you know, we're the ones to make it accessible, um, and I believe that's really important. I'm going to just go. These are just some other maps, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about community, um, building community for shared vision, and in particular, I want to talk about Summer Vision DC, um, which is. Uh, entering its seventh year. Um, uh, we're very excited that Carol Henry's book, uh, The Museum Experience, The Discovery of Meaning, was published in 2010. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Um, I had been working with um, teachers in Fairfax County, Virginia, and the time just seemed to be right. Uh, NAEA found out that after their Baltimore conference, people loved it but they said it's almost too much, so could you offer something other times of the year? So they gave it a try. And we've had uh, about 240 people uh, from all over the United States, maybe not every single state, but I'm still trying for that, a few states missing, and uh, from as far away as Mongolia, Thailand, um, Hawaii, um, anyway, so um, it continues, and our main focus is being a professional learning community. And that is so important for teachers who very often feel they're the only person in the school. But you are all a professional learning community. And you want to keep that. It's really important. So the purpose is that the only real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And um, so it becomes a, a program of renewal, of uh, rejuvenation. Uh, people coming just for themselves. We don't tell them, don't work lesson plans. Just be a sponge. Just be a learner. So um, here are our people. We've actually had 
We had one pilot at Crystal Brim just last summer, but we've had um, uh, 11 <laughs> cohorts. And um, here we are with uh, Deborah Reeve, and we really believe in nurturing the nurturer. So before people come, they are involved in decoding an art museum. They have eight museums. It's really, it should be called Museum Boot Camp, because it's really, and, and so before they ever come, they use an FTC palette to look at that museum based on the web presence, or what they know. And then they add to it once they get there. So they have this virtual experience and then an actual experience. And it's really important not to go into a museum cold, certainly not eight museums cold. <laughs> um, and when we launch it, we have to take a picture of everybody outside by the Henry Moore, um, get our materials, text. Um, we do orientation in the morning, you know, really getting to know one another. And um, we, get, we give out studio materials. And so these portable studios are, are pretty special. Um, they're the only materials you need, plus a, a journal, and everybody wears a view catcher as a necklace. <laughs> and so you kind of imagine how a program like that gets people ready to learn. Uh, what's really nice is we have museum educators, we have elementary, middle, um, high school, um, and uh, supervisors and retired, so we get a, and free service, so we get a whole range of people um, in the program. And it's all about site-specific, critical response. I have to say, I just love this museum here. It is such an honor to be here and to have seen, you know, had had an experience here this morning, um, and to see a museum with, that is so student-centered. Um, and so profound in, in its collection. Um, but anyway, imagine sitting in the peacock room and listening to music and marking and mapping to different kinds and then talking about which music makes more sense once you learn about the story of the peacock room. So um, go to the building museum, and of course it's great to be in Washington, D.C. and it's wonderful to see people 25 people wearing Art Matters bags um, throughout. The um, creative engagement, the artistic practice, working in these journals um, is something that most teachers don't have time to do, and so it's a real gift to them. Um, but they end up taking home amazing souvenirs, like really incredible documentation. The last thing we do, the last hour, or two hours, the hour before the last hour, we actually have them make new eyes maps. And so they have their materials, but we take the journals away. And that's yours, right, Jason? Yeah. They reflect, they do like a visual meditation on the experience to have some quiet time to reflect. Um, and then, here. here's one. It's, it's not a good slide, but I love that it's a great way. <laughs> with the nation's capital, and one vote has Renee, and one has Carol, and the names of the people in it. So, um, and we had a little show in the Reynolds Center, um, uh, right, right by the, uh, which is between the American Art Museum and the Portrait Gallery. So they become a community of learner leaders. We use Facebook, we use Pinterest, we have reunions at uh, NADA conventions, We've had people present at state conventions about the experience bringing their journals. Uh, we've had um, an assessment as well by um, Enid Zimmerman. Um, and what she found, she talks a lot about the development of voice using of her model. And we found that, and she found in her study that folks you know, who, who, who were there really developed that personal voice that they may not have been able to do for a while that collaborative voice and practice and public voice or social action um, being a change agent. Most people say, you know, it's July, but I can't wait to get back to the classroom. So that's really exciting. Um, I also think it's a way of balancing creative leadership competencies. You know, what are your competencies, your comportment? What are your skills? What do you have to offer? Um, and how do you grow that? Um, and then your content. 
you may have learned something or done something, but you may not have, um, uh, it may not be fresh. <laughs> or it might be different because museums give us such wonderful opportunities to uh, connect with objects that we experience. And finally, significance, irrelevance, and value. So um, I, I kind of use the longer quote now um, that the only real voyage consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. But a little more. Here's the, here's the additional part. In seeing the universe through the eyes of another, 100 others, in seeing the 100 universes that each of them sees. That's what we do as art educators. That's the impact of what we do. It's all about the multipliers. So I have to say, I still wonder about that painting. I have it. I still wonder about that ship. But how, I really enjoy those open-ended discussions with my grandfather. And I reflect on its exploration and, and my, giving me a sense of exploring and discovering. In and now, um, for this, for tonight, in uh, reflect, reflecting on my career, the mentors, the colleagues, the students, and others on this special occasion. And I have to share my all-time favorite quote, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Now, as a new grandmother myself, I look into the future of my granddaughter, Simone, named after my husband, Steve, and her generation's new eyes in perceiving and contributing to our amazing visual world. Thank you.